Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to this week's episode of Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. It's April 3rd, we're in April, and we are talking about the week of April 3rd through April 9th. And the giddiness about April is that it's not March. It's not that big, big month. Well, and it it is also a big month, so let me, you know, if this were not a year... I retract that statement. (laughs) Well, no, no, it's not... Don't retract it. It actually, it applies, but there's a distinction between March's enormity and April's enormity. Hmm. April is, in fact, a, a juicy, juicy month, but it's juicy because of regularly occurring intensities that we already know okay. in our bodies. We know how to move through a Mercury retrograde and we've been free of them for two months and that's no longer the case. We know how to process eclipses because twice a year we're in an eclipse season. And that's what makes April bumpy as compared to other months of the year. But again, these are passages that our body knows and recognizes. In March, we moved through two huge ingresses, right? Saturn changing signs and Pluto changing signs within the same calendar month is outrageous. Right. Because those big changes are cat, I was going to say catastrophic. They're not catastrophic. What, what is uh, seismic or cataclysmic? Yeah, there we go. That was the word. <laughs> cataclysmic. That's a great word. It's a nice word. April is gentler. In fact, I will talk all about that this week because it's the first week in April and this Thursday is the first Thursday in the month of April. I will be doing my global healing meditation, 7 p.m. Pacific time, this Thursday evening on my, uh, in my Zoom space. Uh, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not on my mailing list, that's the best way to get the Zoom link. Just go to michaelennox.com when you hear this and sign up for my email mailing list and you'll get the announcement with the Zoom link as well as the recording announcement if you can't be there Thursday evening. But in these Global Healing Meditations, if you've never joined me, I talk about for like 40 minutes all of the astrology for the month, and then I lead us in a guided meditation. So I hope some of you will join me this Thursday. Meanwhile, let's do a question. Let's do it. So Andrea wrote me about uh, Saturn return concepts when Saturn moved into Pisces. So here's Andrea B. asks, Hmm. when does a Saturn return officially begin and end for a person? Is it when transiting Saturn enters and leaves their sign where your Saturn is? So the whole period is your Saturn return? Or is it something else? For example, if your Saturn is in Pisces, duh, I'm sure her Saturn's in Pisces. That's why she's asking. Yeah. Is it when it's tra- when transiting San- Saturn enters and leaves Pisces? Okay. That, I, I'm sorry. Then she goes on and on with like, like at the retrograde or this or that. Or is it when Saturn is near the degree point in the sign where it is in your chart? So great, great question. And the, and the answer really is both depending on how you use astrology. If I practice precision in astrology. So for me, it's much more about when Saturn is at the degree points where Saturn was when you were born. But it is perfectly acceptable to declare that your Saturn return is also by proximity, meaning when the planet Saturn moves into the sign where he was when you were born. In a way, that's the beginning of your Saturn return. And one could think of one Saturn return as lasting two and a half years while Saturn is in the sign that you were born in. So we'll just use Saturn in Pisces as an example. So I respond to precision in astrology for a very specific reason. I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. 
My body is very sensitive to energy, has always been so, and at a level that I rarely meet anybody else who has a similar experience. It's an unusual way of, atypical way of, of a kind of energetic sensitivity. And what I discovered astrology 30 years ago, once I started putting together the astrological waves I was riding and the way I felt in my body, it was fucking eye-opening. It was like, oh my God, this narrative that I'm sick all the time is nonsense. I am sensitive all the time. And there are moments when big waves of energy rise up in my body in a feeling sensation that I might call, well, under the weather, that now I call moon sick. Because it's not like my body is fighting an illness. It's that my body is sensitive and energy is big waves that we ride. And so because of that experience in my body, how I learned and worked with astrology was very, very precise because that's what my body told me. So my second Saturn return was last year. I would not have called the year and a half to two years of Saturn in Aquarius before my Saturn return as part of it. It didn't feel that way, but you can bet your ass it felt like that way all of 2022 because Saturn was in close proximity to my 18 degree, 58 minute Saturn. So for my money, if you were coming to me for a session, I would only declare that you are in your Saturn return when Saturn is within a couple of degrees of where Saturn was when you were born, not the whole passage. Partly because in my little body, it's only impactful when he's close by. And so that's how I present it to y'all. And some Saturn returns are very, very brief because the retrograde might not apply. So some, most people's Saturn's returns hit three times within about a 12-month period, making the whole stretch really hard. Oh, interesting. But so it's because the movement could take a year or it could take two years, everyone's Saturn return is a different length? Well, yes, except a little bit backwards from that. Someone's Saturn return might take a full year or just like a month or two. Oh. If Saturn hits your Saturn exactly right. and then moves far enough forward that by the time it, he retrogrades and comes back your way and he doesn't hit it again because the geometry is just set up, mm. that he hit it right after his last retrograde so that his next retrograde was going to take him way far up ahead. So when he turns around and returns your way, he ain't going to touch it for a second and third time. Got it. Got it. Wow. I, I that's so interesting. I didn't know that. I interpret that. Like that to me, that counts. Right. I think that someone who has a Saturn return that's one pass doesn't need more of a dive to do the work that is regard, you know, necessary to prepare for the next chapter. Because yeah. Saturn returns are very preparatory. They prepare you in the first one for your adult life between 30 and 60 where you're in your most productive and then you prepared for the wisdom section in your last chapter, which I'm now in, of disseminating your wisdom into the world uh, after the second one. So to me, it counts that it's short or long, and then we would interpret that if you were coming in a session. And I wouldn't be interested at all in the notion of, well, Saturn just entered Pisces, but your Saturn is at 20 degrees, but it's starting now. I wouldn't say that. I would say, you're not in it, but next year you will be. Got it. Got it. Right? Hopefully that answers your question, Andrea. Um, and for all of you else who have Saturn in Pisces, whether it's your first or your second Saturn return, note the degree point. If your Saturn is in the first 10 degrees or even the second five, so like zero to 15, your Saturn return has already begun. If your Saturn is at the latter portion of Pisces, then your Saturn return juiciness probably won't start till 24 and 25. So the second big news of the month is Mercury's retrograde cycle, because I'm calling the eclipse season that starts halfway through the month as the big, big energetic sort of uh, intensity of, of 
April, but Mercury is now making the shifts that signal his next cycle is upon us. And it starts today with Mercury moving into Taurus. So first and foremost, let's just talk about the communication shift that happens when the planet of mind and thought and perception moves into the Venus-ruled territory of Taurus. Taurus is a beautiful, grounded, stable mansion, and Mercury's communication perspective gets more grounded, a little bit slower, more methodical in how we approach thought and communication, and we can benefit from that, right? Perception-wise, because Mercury also guides how we are perceiving our lives, Because Taurus is ruled by Venus, we're more likely to be able to see our world through the lens of love. Hmm. Now, normally, Mercury spends two and a half weeks in a sign, but he's going retrograde here. So he'll be here for a, a, a little bit of a while. And the shadow of his retrograde actually starts this Friday. So every retrograde cycle, whether it's Mercury or any other planet, they all go through these three acts. And with Mercury, it's really important to know and understand this because the first act is when Mercury has entered the territory that he's going to zigzag over two more times. So that means that as he enters this territory, which he does on Friday... He's signaling to us that everything that happens for essentially like two weeks is going to potentially be part of what he returns to when he goes backward. So it's like, pay attention what's happening right now for these couple weeks. See what's the theme because it's going to maybe hit. That's right. I call this retrograde cycle the brochure. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) We're going to go on a journey and you're handed a brochure that tells you everything you need to know. So if you're not paying attention to the communication gaffes, the breakdowns, the conflicts, and the way that communication sometimes signals that something needs your attention, if you're not paying attention in the first couple of weeks while Mercury is prepping us, then when he turns around on the 21st of April, we will be bumping into the furniture much more (laughs) ghastly-like because we haven't been paying attention. So that section of, of the cycle starts this Friday and goes for two weeks between April 7th, which is Friday, and the 21st when he turns around. I will mention this again in next week's pod because we'll still be in the data collection portion before he actually does his backward journey. But that begins this Friday, so begin paying attention once we get to this weekend. I will also say that this particular Mercury retrograde is a little less bumpy than some. Partly because one of the triple transits that Mercury is going to make in the early degrees of Taurus is a sextile to Saturn, who's newly ingressed into Pisces. So they are 60 degrees apart all through this cycle. Now, Mercury retrogrades are not Saturn lessons, but they are instructive to us. Like we are in a process designed to use awareness and wisdom to shift and change our communication dynamics and our perception challenges. So if this retrograde has the teacher in a kind of productive geometry with Mercury, then A, the whole process should have a little bit more of a slow and steady wins the race, both because Mercury is in a slow, steady sign, but also because he's interacting in a a sort of a strong connection to Saturn that will say, move slow enough to get the lessons. There's a semi-square three times between Mercury and Neptune. And here's where it's going to be a Mercury retrograde (laughs) because while Saturn will keep us moving slow and steady so we don't miss the communication lessons that we're going to get, 
The semi-square to Neptune means we're also going to bump into blind spots, cloudiness, confusion, and moments where we really are not clear from the neck up. So it's both. There's always a contradiction in astrology. Right. My job is to <laughs> interpret into the contradictions. And we'll talk about this more when Mercury turns around, obviously, because that's when this information will count a little bit more. I'm giving you the overview and the prep since the brochure is handed out on Friday. You want to know that part of what we will be dealing with is lessons from Saturn and blind spots and confusion as we move through the process of those lessons from Neptune. So the full moon on the 5th this week. So what's that? That's Wednesday, mm -hmm. right? So the full moon is Wednesday. Now, this is not yet eclipse season, so we don't quite have the intensity that that will bring. But this is a pretty rock and sock and powerful full moon, mostly because of what's happening over in Aries as this full moon has been building. It's a full moon in so Aries or... Yes. Well, the full moon is in Libra, but the sun is in Aries, right? right. So the conscious awareness of, of Wednesday's full moon has us in consideration of the self with a capital S. That's the, that's the Aries sensibility. Me first. Libra says we first, not me, but we. So it's a relational full moon where at the very simplest perspective, we're celebrating the mirror consciousness, acknowledging that what we see out there is a reflection of what we feel inside of us. That's a Libra perspective. And this is just the standard relational polarity in, in astrology, where Aries is a self, uh, Libra is other, and it's the relational trajectory. In the most simplistic way, in a Libra full moon, we're celebrating the ways we relate to others powerfully. And the, uh, and the magnificent sense of understanding that life is a mirror, and when we operate through that principle, life is, is, is more graceful and powerful. And so we're going to release anything that helps us lift up our sense of the mirror consciousness, and anything that might selfishly and myopically focused on the me portion of any engagement to be released so we can have a more powerful experience of others. So standard relational full moon, drop what you have to, to have more harmonious, loving relationships of all types. But part of why this is a big full moon, both energetically and then archetypally, is because the Aries sun is hanging out with Jupiter and Chiron, who just came together in the last couple of weeks. So just from a pure energetic perspective of what this week is going to feel like outside of how you might work with the full moon or the archetypal meaning of where this full moon is, it's simply a full moon week which promises more intensity, more passion, more emotion, more bumps in the road in an energetic general sort of way. Mm. And so to have the Aries sun, which is already lighting us on fire, right next to Jupiter in Aries, which takes everything and amplifies it exponentially, that alone makes this full moon a like a 10 out of 10 in volume. Okay. The fact that the sun is right next to Chiron makes this a healing demand. Hmm. Now, Jupiter and Chiron came together by conjunction two weeks ago, and so we're still moving through the awarenesses that, that, uh, that helped us arrive at. Any solar transit increases what we can be consciously aware of. So as Jupiter, the sense of expansion and what is possible in terms of growth was meeting up with the, the dude who holds our wounded and healing process in his, you know, bailiwick, has made this entire section of the year about deep, expansive healing. In fact, I would say that the real value of Jupiter and Chiron, because Jupiter only brings beauty and yummy and expansion, is that this is a moment in time where healing work in the past weeks, months, and years can actually be showing up as new ways we're operating out there in the world. That's what Aries gives us. Aries says, 
I'm ready. I want to rush into the new consciousness with all the gusto that I, that I can muster. So you have the archetypal sense of, okay, I'm aware of all the healing that I have been through. Now I'm even more, more aware this week because the sun will directly conjunct Chiron on Tuesday and then move one degree further as we move into the full moon on Wednesday. So if a full moon is a release opportunity and our conscious awareness is staring right into the pit of our wounds this week, then what we might be able to release from our psyche that is actually inhibiting us from having more beautiful and powerful relationships will be beautifully supported by this full moon. You can't heal a wound you're not aware of. Yeah, absolutely. Sun and Chiron makes us aware, right? Sun and Jupiter makes us aware that life can be a party. But in order for us to enjoy the good that is our birthright, we do have to clear away wounds of the past. And that's very powerfully built into this full moon. And I would add to just the description of the energy of this full moon is, is that it's on fire and so we will be as well. And Aries energy tends to be impulsive to a fault. But in the backdrop, of this full moon and sort of really riding all week is a building trine between Mars in Cancer and Saturn in Pisces. So that puts into the week a kind of breaks on, slow down, don't move too fast or you might miss the lesson. And hopefully that will ballast the intense fieriness of all of this Aries energy so that as you move through this week, kids, and want to celebrate and, and ritualize this full moon, that you slow down for a moment, you take a look at how deeply the wound healing has been for you the last few months, and identify what are you ready to release and drop. And if you don't know, if you can't come up with this, you know, in a, in a mental, intellectual understanding of it, your prayer can simply be, I am ready to release every inhibition to greater love and more satisfying relationships, both known and unknown, conscious and unconscious. And so it is. If you tell the unconscious to operate in places that are both known and unknown, then the unconscious can't argue with you. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you give it the spaciousness to to release things that we're not mentally aware of, but our, but our psyche is aware of. And, and just know that this is one big-ass full moon to let go of the things that would inhibit you from more loving relationships and a greater understanding that when you look out on the world and you want to affect a change, that change has to happen inside of yourself. And when you make those changes, the outside world will shift immediately. Trust that and have at it. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. This week, we have an email and dream from Kat. It's from the archives. I want to say thank you to everyone who sends in their dreams. Um, you know, we can only get to one per episode, so I appreciate your patience. All right. Kat says, I've been listening to the podcast for a while, and I'm always fascinated by the dream segment. So I decided to drop a line of a recurring dream. I've had this dream three times now within the space of a couple weeks, 
And each time there are things that remain consistent, but there are slight variations with each occurrence as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty standard. The dream is part of a larger dream, which I can never recall, but I find myself at the entrance to an alleyway between two buildings. They appear to be some type of shopping area of a town I'm not familiar with. It's busy with lots of people around and a stream of people heading into this alleyway in front of me. I'm with my dog, Ivar, and as soon as we begin to head towards this alley, he either pulls on his lead to rush in, or, in the third occurrence, with no lead, he simply runs in to chase something. I look up to see, among the crowds of people moving through the alley, a tall bear walking on its hind legs. Ah, oh, here we go. I love it. Oh, just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> it has the fur of a teddy bear rather than uh-huh. a grizzly, uh-huh. right. all curly and gingery in color. I don't see the top half of the bear because my focus is on my dog rushing to bite the bear on his leg. In the first couple dreams, I'm able to pull Ivar back on his lead before he gets too close but the bear does seem to notice our presence, stopping to turn around. And we're able to back, mm, but we're able to back off without any issues. However, in this most recent occurrence, which Ivar is not on his leash, he gets a hold of the bear's leg. What's most interesting to me is that as he runs towards the bear, I can't grab him because his fur is gone. He looks more like a fat Hmm. pig. But by the time he bites into the leg of the bear, he's very much himself once again. (laughs) Wow. The bear is wearing a pink t-shirt when Ivar bites into (laughs) his leg. And it seems like there's a plastic covering on the leg, like he doesn't want to get his fur dirty. I shout at Ivar, leave, but he ignores me. I realize after shouting a few times that my voice is not authoritative enough. It's too high pitch and I lower it. He Ah. hears me, glances towards me, but does not let go of the bear, who is now halted and is turning towards me. I'm grabbing Ivar to leave, and the bear fully turns and starts towards me as I manage to pull my dog off him. In the moments before Ivar bites down on the bear, I'm concerned that he will notice me and that he'll get angry and will attack. As I'm scrambling to get Ivar off him, I'm more concerned that we will become his next meal. I find a small nook in the wall on the side of the alley and scooch into it with Ivar at my feet, hoping the bear will walk by us. But at that moment, as he approaches, I wake from the dream. I'd love to know your thoughts, Michael. Best he I have so many. I know. I oh, I right? am very curious. Sometimes I do like a little. I try to analyze it before you do, um, based on what <laughs> I know. But this one, no clue, because the bear is a teddy bear. <laughs> well, it 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 starts as a teddy bear, which I think is the medicine's intention of trying to be more palatable so that cat will receive the bear medicine. Oh. So let me let me uh, say something about animal medicine dreams as I have heard thousands of them over the, you know, my whole life since I've been listening to dreams since I was, you know, golly. I've been I've been interpreting dreams since I was a teenager. It's been over 40 years. Jeepers creepers. All right. The point I was going to make, though, let me make the point instead of getting tripped out about how old I am. (laughs) The point is people who dream of animals, um, the dream content almost always has them resisting the animal medicine, like being afraid or feeling like I've got to hide from this bear so that it doesn't get me. Right. Meanwhile, in the world of meaning, this dream is about cat incorporating and receiving bear medicine, which is always about both strength and power, the understanding of the value of rest and restoration, because they hibernate, and the notion that your power is something that you don't need to flex in order to own. 
Mm. Like nobody's looking at the bear in the woods thinking, I wonder if this is a strong, big bear. <laughs> right? The bear doesn't have to do anything to exhibit our perception of it as strong, powerful, and dangerous. So there's no need to flex. Right. <sighs> so at the beginning and the end of the day, this is a dream about Kat receiving the energy of understood and incorporated power, the recognition of when to rest and, and not stand in power, and through love, the principle of love, the dog, uh, we're, we're trying to grab this energy and so that our walk Cats walk through life, can have more bear energy, hence the dog Ivor grabbing the bear by the leg. But there's so much more in the journey, so let's start at the top. An alleyway between two buildings is hidden areas of consciousness that, that, that go between structures, right? So if a building is a structure, in symbolic land, we can think of a building as a an idea or a thought form that's big enough to merit a structure. Like, I, I'm making this up, but say the alleyway was between a bank and a grocery store. Mm -hmm. The bank represents sort of financial uh, flow and abundance and prosperity, and the grocery store would represent nurturance and sustenance because it's where we get food. So an alleyway is not about abundance and finances, and it's not about food and nurturance. It's in between structural idea. So things happen in alleyways and we have to be comfortable with them to understand how things are laid out, right? If we knew the alleyways in our dreams, we would know not only the structural thoughts that we have, we'd know more about some of the hidden thoughts, hmm. some of the ways in between in our consciousness that, that we're frightened of. It's a shadow place. Right. Because you never know what's going to happen in the alley. Subconscious? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yes, the, but parts of the subconscious or the unconscious that we can actually traverse, but we tend to stay away from because they seem dark or shadowy or dangerous. Mm. So they are an invitation to explore shadowy stuff. And in this particular dream sequence, it's about finding the powerful medicine of bare consciousness if you're willing to go into shadow work of the alley. Hmm. So this is where Ivar comes in. Like, Ivar wants in! <laughs> like, with each progressive dream, he makes sure that his ability to run into the alley is unobstructed. Right. Including that he shapeshifts in the third dream so that Cat doesn't have any hair to grab onto. Okay, that's what it is. So that's what I was wondering. Why is, you know what I mean? Why does the dog go Right, why did that occur? Well, for me, as I perceive this dream and this storyline, what I see is that Ivar, which represents Cat's most comfortable, trusting, loving self. Hmm. Right? Because our dogs trust and love us. And so that part of Cat would be her unbridled heart Loving and trusting life without, you know, the joke is you put your, your boyfriend and your dog in the trunk of your car for three days and who's happy to see you? <laughs> <laughs> so the dog in us, the dog in Cat's dream is her unbridled joyful love. I'll go anywhere that, that might lead me to more love. And in the first dream, Cat's resistance is strong. She's got the dog on a leash. She's holding him back. In the second dream, there is no leash. He runs in. And then I think I'm getting this right. In the third dream, it's such that he shapeshifts for just the amount of time where Cat's trying to hold him back. And then he goes back to his regular form. That's, I think, a crafty way that this consciousness of unbridled love and joy and enthusiasm that Cat has um, will get her into this alley come hell or high water. Mm-hmm. Then even the bear is sort of trying to convey that there's a, a, a lightness to this, the, the pink t-shirt. I also like pink as a color because it combines the red of the root chakra and white of the highest unity of light. You put them together, you get pink, and pink is a sort of a color of cosmic love grounded in our physical reality. Hmm. 
the plastic covering on the leg so the leg isn't dirty. I think that's just sort of a symbol that says this biting of the leg, the grabbing of the leg is not problematic. We're protected. We can, we can, we can let the dog bite the bear. It's, it's part of this, that the dog in the dream leads. So Kat's unbridled enthusiasm leads her to more power if she will allow it. So the plastic is not a protection. It's... Well, it is a protection. It's sort of, it's not a protection from the bite. Mm. The dog can bite through plastic. It's that the, the leg won't get dirty. Ah, okay. Yes. So the plastic covering is to help make the process that the dream wants to have happen, i.e. dog bites bear. But the plastic sort of makes it not dirty. Mm-hmm. Like the plastic is not going to keep the bite from happening. Right. So between the plastic on the leg and the bear wearing a pink T-shirt, I think we're, we're having other evidence that this is a positive outcome that we want to allow happen. But the real juice, the real juice is in what happens at the very end where she shouts, wants to shout, leave. Well, she does shout it. But her voice is not authoritative enough. Well, there's the sort of linchpin of what then the value of powerful bear energy might be offering Kat at this time. Might be a stronger, more authoritative voice that knows its own strength, that doesn't have to flex it, but isn't afraid of it either. Now, she's still in a little resistance because at the end, she's trying to hide from the bear by finding a little nook in the alley where she and her connection to love will hope that the bear will pass her right by. But of course, we wake up (laughs) because we wake up. And the, the idea is, you know, I think that that impulse to hide from the bear is just more resistance, but that the message is, allow the change, go into the shadow work of the alley, let the enthusiasm for life that you have, Kat, take you into shadowy places where if you're courageous, part of what you will get from the shadow work is a stronger, more powerful voice that will lead you out into your life in a stronger, more effective manner. Loved this dream. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.